I want to welcome you to Elvis Week, and we have none other than T.G. Shepard, one of Elvis Presley's close friends with us today. And T.G., right off the bat, how did you meet Elvis Presley? Wow. It was predestined, Doc. I uh, told my mom when I was 13, I said, Mom, someday I'm going to meet Elvis. He's going to become my friend. And she said, Son, I hate to hate for you to get your hopes up too high because the chances of you ever meeting him, let alone becoming his friend, are astronomical. Well, at 15 years old, my mom and dad had divorced, and I was living at home with my dad. He was very strict and didn't want music in the house. I knew I wanted music for my life. So I climbed out of the back window at 15 years old, and I ran away from home. And I hitchhiked to Memphis and uh, was living in the alleyways and eating out of garbage cans, literally, at that age. And late one night, I was at a skating rink. And uh, I'm standing out in front. The lights were off, and three or four Cadillacs pull up. And Elvis gets out from behind the wheel of the lead car and walks right over to me. And he asked me where I was going. And I said, uh, they're closing the rink down, so I'm leaving. And he said, oh, no, they're opening it up for me. <laughs> of course, I'm looking into the blue eyes of Elvis Presley. I mean, it was just, I'll never forget that moment. I was excited. I was I had fear. I had, it was an emotional roller coaster meeting him and having him talk to me. And so I went inside and roller skated with he and his mafia friends at the time, not knowing that I would someday become one of those mafia guys. And uh, after we roller skated that night and we met, he asked me, he said, Are you hungry? And I said, <laughs> Of course, in those days, I was starving all the time, being, you know, uh, homeless so to speak. He put me in the car and drove me up to Graceland, fed me the famous peanut butter and banana sandwich. We talked till seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And he said, give me your phone number. And I thought, yeah, sure. He'll never remember me, you know, after tonight. This is a one-time thing in my life. It'll go down as a great memory. Well, lo and behold, the next day, I get a phone call from Charlie Hodge who worked for Elvis. And he said, Elvis wants to know what you're doing tonight. And I said, well, I'm not doing anything. You want to go to the movies with us? And I said, well, I'd love to. And they had a car come pick me up, take me to the Memphian. And from that night on, we were close friends until the day he passed, 16 years later. And uh, Elvis was one of those rare individuals that, uh, to a lot of people, he's the king, but he always said there was only one king, and that was Jesus Christ. I always respected that he said that, but he was the most down-to-earth person that I've ever known, the most spiritual person I've ever known. He used to sit and read me the Bible and tell me his interpretation of the scriptures. Wow. Just to have one of those moments back and hear his voice and have him read me a scripture from the Bible again would be the most incredible wish I could ever have come true again. But I know I'll see him again, and I know he'll read to me again. He's just an incredible human being. But I met him in a roller rink, long story short. I met him in a roller rink in Memphis when I was 15. Wow. Now, let me ask you this, T.G. What is, of all that time you spent with Elvis, what was your biggest memory? I mean... You know, yes, meeting him, um, and 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 I know about the story of when you were heading to Nashville the day before Elvis died. But of that whole sixteen years, what would be the biggest memory uh, of your time with Elma, Elvis that you you will always cherish? There are two or three. He called me up late one night. I was asleep, one o'clock in the morning, and he said, "Anytime he would call me, the words were always, what are you doing?'" <laughs> on this particular night I said well I'm sleeping what do you need he said I need you to come out to the house so I get dressed I get in my car and I drive out to Graceland I'm driving up the gates up the, up the driveway he's headed out the front door he said get in the limo I said where are we going he said Dallas I said Dallas Texas <laughs> he said yeah 
course, he had just bought a little small jet star, which is parked next to the Lisa Marie at Graceland. Well, we're on the plane, and this is a great memory. We're on the plane sitting knee to knee, maybe two feet apart from each other, small jet, only seated maybe six people. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I bought you a bus today. I said, a tour bus? He said, yep. He said, I bought you a tour bus to kind of help you get started. I like that new record you got, Devil in the Bottle. And he said, I love hearing it, love singing along with it on the radio. I sent J.D. Sumner and Larry Strickland, who was married to Naomi Judd. I sent them up north to, on a private jet to pick you up a bus and bring it back to you. That was probably one of the most memorable moments of my career and my life, to have Elvis Presley believe in me enough to gift me with that large of a gift. And what it did, somebody asked me one time, is that the greatest gift he ever gave you? No, it wasn't. The bus was the catalyst for what he really gave me. What the bus did was give me the confidence that someone like him believed in me enough. He gave me the confidence to work harder and not let him down. So I worked harder and that's the reason that I was able to break through is that I didn't want to disappoint someone like him who believed in me. So that was one of my most memorable moments with Elvis. You know, that, that brings me back to a story, TG, that I've heard. Uh, I was luck. I was very fortunate enough to meet JD Sumner, yeah. and a lot of people don't realize that JD was probably the one that kind of birthed the tour bus. Yeah, and uh, to hear you tell that story and knowing it was JD going out to find that bus, because I if I and you probably know the story about JD when he got his bus. You know, Elvis told him. Uh, I want to be the first one to drive it. <laughs> and it scared well, JD to no end with the way Elvis was driving that bus. He's like, oh my gosh, he's going to tear up my tour bus before I get to start touring in it. But, uh, you know, it's just to hear that you tell that story. I mean, that just shows Elvis the man. I mean, not just the entertainer, but a man with a heart that has generosity just He's just generous, you know, generous from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. I mean, that's you know, Elvis Presley. I asked him one time, and I don't know if I've ever mentioned this. I asked him one time, I said, why do you give everything away? I mean, someone would walk up to him and say, that's a beautiful ring, Elvis. And he'd say, here, I want you to have it. He'd give things away, houses, cars. And I asked him one time, I said, why do you do that? And he said, let me tell you where it started. He said, when I lived in the projects in Lauderdale Court in Memphis, and we were poor, there were some kids a couple of doors down that when they would get through with their comic books, we couldn't afford to buy them. They would come and give them to me to read as a gift. And that feeling of when they gave me those comic books, that those gifts to me, that feeling I wanted other people to know that feeling someday. And so when I got into a position to give away large gifts, the reason I gave them was because I wanted the expression on their face and I wanted them to feel what I felt as a kid. Mm -hmm. So that's why he became a giver. One of the first things that ever happened was receiving those comic books. And he practiced that all through his life of giving and not taking. Because he already knew the feeling of what it was like to receive, sure. and he wanted other people to feel yeah. the exact same way. Sure. Yeah. He was just he he was just a genuine guy. I mean, in the beginning, when we were just developing the friendship, in the first few weeks or months, it was really strange because I was intimidated. I was I was in shock still. But as the years went on. He just became a guy. He just became a friend. I still knew he was Elvis, but he, to me, he was just a friend. He was just a, just one of the guys who would sit and talk about anything and who loved to laugh and who I've seen him cry. Uh, 
just as a great human being. For every negative thing that anyone ever heard about Elvis, there's a million wonderful positive things that you'll never hear. He was just a great guy and what a force, you know? I know he left us young at 42, but that old saying that the brighter the star, the quicker that it can burn out. And man, he, he lived a lot of life in his 42 years, but he was so bright. It was no, uh, no wonder that he left us so young. Uh, DG, you know, my whole purpose of Elvis week is to shine a big light on, on the man. None of, none of the, the tabloid stuff and none of the girlfriends right. and all that stuff. Right. I, it's Elvis, you know, the man himself, the man behind uh, the jumpsuits and the movies. Yeah. And, and you bring that forth to all of us, and I appreciate it. So what did you think of the brand new Elvis movie? I thought it was great. I, uh, I've seen it more than once. <laughs> when... When I knew it was coming, I, I got a, a phone call from Jerry Schilling. And uh, my dear friend, Jerry, God, uh, it's like a brother to me. We call each other brothers because, well, he's the only one I got left, him and Barry Gibb. And I got a call from Jerry and I got a call from Priscilla. Uh, we were staying in touch with Priscilla a lot. Kelly, Kelly Lang, my wife, and I were fortunate to have her as a dear friend. And they both were telling us that you will be amazed when you see the movie. Uh, and I was. I went to see it a few weeks ago. It took me a moment to see Austin Butler as Elvis. But after a few minutes into the movie, you, you accepted it. And it, he had him down to movements. Uh, his, he, did his, he did his homework, Austin did. Yeah, he did, and I, and I remember, yeah, because I saw we all, we all saw the movie, and and for me the moment when he stepped on that stage for the 1968 comeback that was magic. I was like, uh, is that Austin or is that Elvis? Sure, it was. I mean, I mean it was grueling. It was grueling on Austin to the point to where when he got through, he just he had to just take some time off. It just strained him. Um, you know, really and truly, the new Elvis movie is Elvis's second comeback. The 68, it's his second 68 comeback special. This is creating a wave of new fans coming in to discover Elvis for the first time. A lot of people. So it's the second 68 comeback special, the new movie. Uh, Tom Hanks playing Colonel Parker. I thought he did a great job. There were little things that, that I noticed differently, but because I worked closely with Colonel Parker uh, with, when I was with RCA and Elvis. And, but Tom Hanks just, I think, nailed Colonel Parker. And, <laughs> well, what, well, what was your opinion of, of Colonel Parker himself? I mean, not from the movie, from your personal dealings with the Colonel. You know, a lot of people put the Colonel down for... Uh, his percentages and stuff with Elvis and everything. I, I'm, I'm not saying that that was right, uh, percentage wise, but um, I, I really and truly believe that a lot of Elvis's success came because of the belief that Colonel Parker had. And he was loyal to Elvis. He was managing Hank Snow and Eddie Arnold at the time, and they went to the wayside. Elvis became his focus. And he saw in Elvis uh, something incredible that maybe a lot of people didn't see at that time. And Vernon was a big Eddie Arnold fan. So with Colonel Parker managing Eddie Arnold, well, son, you got to let Colonel Parker manage you because he manages Eddie Arnold. So uh, Parker did a lot for Elvis, uh, but he was hard to work with for me. Uh, he was very intimidating. Uh, but uh, I always admired the fact that uh, he really, really believed in Elvis. And so there's there's pros and cons to, to Parker. He was a very multifaceted guy. And uh, he was a perfectionist when it comes to Elvis and how he wanted things done. So he did a lot of great for Elvis. And then I know that we would have seen more of Elvis in Europe and overseas if it hadn't been for Colonel Parker. Because oh, yeah, I completely agree with that. 
Yeah, he, he, Elvis really wanted to go there, and that held him back. Star is Born could have been a huge movie to put Elvis into the serious acting roles that he wanted to do his whole career. But Colonel Parker did not want uh, Elvis to do that because he felt that he would get second billing to Barbara Streisand. So there were some some decisions made through Parker that I think were wrong, that could have been better. But uh, there's pros and cons about Parker. But I, I had a chance to work alongside of him, and uh, Tom Hanks did a great job portraying him. Well, I would like for you to share with all of my viewers and my listeners the the very touching moment that you had with Elvis the day before he died. Well, it was uh, still tough. You know, it was um, racquetball had taken place in the racquetball court that night. A crown had gotten loosened and the tour was starting the next day and he was he was going to go to the dentist late that night. And uh, he was sitting in the car and I went up to the car and uh, I was headed back to Nashville that night. And I just squatted down next to the car and put my hands in the window and he said, uh, take care of yourself. And uh, you're going back home. I said, yeah, I'm going to Nashville. And he just put his hand on my hand and said, be careful, I love you. He never told me that before. And I wondered afterwards, was he saying goodbye to me? I don't know, but that was the last words he spoke to me. Mm. Very touching, touching night. The whole time that I was around him was touching. He touched my heart in a way that no other performer ever will. Well, Elvis was the man. No, there is no greater entertainer um, that we've ever seen on the face of this earth. Sold more albums than anybody could even count. Touched yeah. lives. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what I want you to see. I, I wanted you to see Elvis, the human being, the giver, the friend. And you've seen this from his close friend, T.G. Shepard. And T.G., I want to thank you so much for sharing us with your, your time today and, and the stories of Elvis Presley. Well, you know, there'll never be another Elvis. Uh, the amazing thing for me is that I think a lot of people are still in denial that he's gone because what's happened, he is still here so vividly through his music Photos, movies, radio shows, and now the new movie. Uh, a lot of us, including me for the first few years, I was in denial the first couple of years. I didn't mourn really until a year or two later when I just sat down one day and I said, wow, he's really gone. I'll never see him again, but I know I will. Uh, he left behind an incredible legacy. And we're still enjoying that legacy 40 something years later now. And, and with this new movie, I'm telling you, it's just, it's an incredible movie that everyone should see. If you love music, and if there was ever anything about Elvis Presley that you ever admired or loved or liked, you, you need to experience the movie. I, I strongly yeah. recommend it. Yeah. Uh, I, I do too. I mean, it took us hours, I think, to come down um, after watching the film, because there was just so much to absorb yeah. and to think about. And uh, I've got to hand it to uh, Baz uh, Lerman for... Oh, uh, man, he... Uh, what a vision. What a it, vision. And, and, you know, it was an emotional roller coaster for me because I was throughout the movie in a lot of those places like the International Hotel and, and on tour with Elvis uh, through my RCA years. And... The ending of the movie to me was, I was very saddened at the end to see the way it ended. It had to end, the movie had to end that way. But it, it was sad. I, I felt really sad for a few minutes after the movie ended. I just kind of sat there and was drinking it all in. But it was, uh, I think he would be proud 
I think he would be very, very proud if he could see them. And who knows? He's probably seen the movie already. Yeah, I mean, wow. And you said it perfectly. This is Elvis's second comeback. Yeah. And I, I can already tell, uh, not just all of us who have always been fans, but the brand new fans. And uh, I was even talking to my wife yesterday. I said, I'm sure Graceland, the, the, the tour has just exploded. She goes, I've heard there, it's, it's getting bigger than ever. More and more people yeah. are, are wanting to see this man, Elvis Presley. And, uh, but yeah, Elvis's second comeback, it's here and it's here to yeah. stay. And you know what? It'll keep coming back because when you're that big in life, you never go away. No, not at all. And TG, wow. Again, I want to thank you uh, for your time sharing no. us your life and your life with Elvis Presley. Uh, it's been an absolute blessing. Thank you. It's always good to visit with you. Hope to have dinner with you soon. Uh, that is going to happen. And ladies and gentlemen, be sure to tune in to the T.G. Shepherd Show on Sirius XM's Prime Country Channel 58 every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern and again on Saturdays at 12 a.m. Eastern and Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Go to tgshepherd.com for all of his great music, his merch, and his tour dates. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 